Hi, everyone. Welcome to group three of today's talks. Uh, we have three talks for you today from 105 to 150 p.m. today. Our first is Hannah Lee, per my last email, communication online versus AFK. Hannah is a discovery and systems librarian at California State University, Dominguez Hills in Beverly Hills, California. Hello, and welcome to this talk entitled, Per My Last Email, Communication Online versus AFK. My name is Hannah Lee, and I'm the Discovery and Systems Librarian for California State University, Dominguez Hills. Communication during COVID times has changed. What we've lost in being able to talk face-to-face -face is a lot of nonverbal communication. So going forward, what we need from one another is a lot of forgiveness a lot of understanding and a lot of patience. So going forward, let's keep in mind that we're gonna keep yesterday's problems in the past and focus on today and what we can achieve going forward. What does this title mean? Well, per my last email is a very, very nice way of saying to redirecting people to long communications or even short communications via email that has all the information a requester would need, but maybe they just didn't read it all the way. Through. Alternatively, AFK means away from keyboard, which is more of a gaming lingo, where a player might be away from their keyboard and therefore unavailable. The way that we communicate online is gonna be very different from the way that we communicate in person. So one of the major challenges that we face is there are so many tools that are available to us. If you're in a major institution like I am, you might be urged to use the software that IT provides. In my particular case, I use um, Outlook with a combination of, with a bunch of other tools, including Slack and Confluence and on very different levels, depending on where you're working. So I can be working anywhere from the university level to the college level, to even a system-wide level, because the CSUs are part of the Cal State University systems. There are also other tools like Trello, Jira, Basecamp that are intended to be project management tools, but they might not be the best tool for all circumstances. And understanding which tools are best utilized for which communication style is something that you're, everyone's gonna have to figure going forward. So as a person of color and as a woman, I've faced a lot more challenges. Um, especially during my time in the private sector before starting my academic career back in August of 2020, which seems very long time ago and yet not long enough. There's a lot of assumptions, especially surrounding gender. In part, it has to do with a lot of the unspoken labor that's expected of women and in that sort of professional space. A lot of times I've been called on to be the note taker or the person who books rooms for meetings and travel, or the person who does general office housework. Now, the issue is that it imputes upon my time and the ability for me to do my work. But in addition to that, there are also other gender-related annoyances, let's say, um, that come with being a woman. Part of it is that the assumption that is I am not as knowledgeable as men in my field and oftentimes and oftentimes I'm called upon to use a smile more so than my skills when the reality is that I sometimes have that sort of neutral angry face that I can't help so my norm for a lot of people looks like I'm either angry mad or frustrated when in reality I could just be thinking and being a person of color means a lot of assumptions. I am from an Asian ethnicity, so the assumption is that I know a lot about tech. This kind of assumption and this kind of work can be very tiring, especially if it comes from a perspective of ignorance and if it comes from a perspective of white privilege. So a lot of the assumptions that people have about me and my background is going to be an effort towards moving toward to a collective understanding. 
Now, until we get to that point of understanding, there's going to be a lot of back and forth talk, especially about things like money and education, where I might be a first generation immigrant with first generation higher education degrees, being the first person in my family to achieve a certain socioeconomic threshold. And a lot of the times, my other colleagues, and I'm not saying I'm not calling out any institution or any colleagues in particular, but as a general sort of rule, a lot of times people don't understand where my background is or where I'm coming from, or the fact that my history makes my experiences so much different from the person next to me. I had to transition from the private sector to academia. And let me just say, I like it here. I like being in a university setting and I like the work that I do so much more so than when I was doing it in the private sector. It's different for sure. So when I was working with private companies, the pacing was a lot faster. People expected emails and responses within minutes, if not hours. And that was the norm rather than the exception. One thing that private companies and academia do share is that the diversity of people that is present not only in staff, but in also in faculty, is going to vary depending on where you are. In general, people of color and women are less so in management roles and leadership roles, and this is both on the academic and private side. Now, the different types of communication that are available is broken down into three general categories that I've seen, formal, semi-formal, and informal. I think for me, coming from my particular background, I thought of everything as needing to be formal, where everything is an email with dear and sincerely. Every informal talk is between friends rather than peers. And so in the last few years, as I began working in private industries and in academia, I've been quickly disillusioned of that fact and happily so. And so these are my categories and experiences for understanding what is formal, semi-formal, and informal. For me, formal are widespread announcements where stakeholder involvement has been vetted out and where you need to keep a lot of people in the same sort of conversation. Um, semi-formal is something similar to formal where you can use things like email and meetings. But it might be from a more mutual communication. Formal, I see from more of a top-down communication where things are proclaimed or announced, whereas semi-formal is more of a discussion. Now, informal is definitely a discussion where it could be something as similar, uh, simple as a, hi, how are you? Or what was your weekend like? To how do I do this thing I forgot? And so what we do with informal communication is build up those relationships, use those water cooler moments that we've missed out on, especially during COVID, to build up camaraderie and build up friendships where it might not be otherwise. I've used a lot of informal communications in part because I've not met any of my colleagues in person. So, this type of informal communication is very key, not only to what I do, but also to my tenure here at CSUDH. And so you have these different communication styles. You have to implement them somehow. And so these are the three sort of strategies I've developed. One is a top-down approach. And ideally this top-down approach would have happened last year in March or maybe even April during the beginning of the pandemic when things were moving online. And ideally, this would have happened from sort of a dean or manager level. Everyone comes to a shared understanding, like, this is how we're going to do it. Make sure you keep everyone in the loop. The other way is a ground up approach where things are more, everyone's more in agreement. But maybe it's not from a directive. It's more along the lines of, hey, I created this thing. Everyone jump on if you want to. But the idea from a ground up approach is that it's also about trying to find the tool that best, fit, best fits your institution. This can be a lot of trying and a lot of experimentation, but that's okay. That's what online tools are for, is to try it, experiment in it, and find something else that is a better fit. Then the organic approach is just doing what needs to be done and finding the tools that you need to, but doing it in such a way that it's not systematic. 
So the idea between a ground up approach and organic approach is kind of the idea that sprung up at CSUDH. Um, and I think for that, it is stronger because it comes from the people who use it. If it comes down from a directive, hey, this is what we're gonna use without any input or with input, people might be inclined to use it. But for me, from what I've seen, the ground up and organic approaches have a stronger communication style and people tend to use those tools a lot more. The important takeaway is that once you do commit to a platform or a style, stick with it, just agree with it. You might want to introduce something at a later point, but don't make sure not to overload yourself. Also make sure that you set boundaries. There is no need to give out personal information like your Instagram handle or your Facebook um, or connecting to each other on Facebook. Work is work and your personal time is your personal time. Don't feel as though you need to overlap the two. And you definitely wanna be an ally. If you see something, say something. Let others be heard. If you feel or observe an opportunity where people are being overlooked, call them out. And this is perhaps my most important point. Turn it off if you need to. Put down the phone, turn off your computer. And if you're the type of person to never shut down your computer, try shutting down your computer or putting it to sleep because you don't have to be online 24 seven. Let's discuss about this. What do you think should happen going forward? What do you think has worked for you in the past? And let's figure everything out because the only way we're gonna get through this is getting through this together. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Again, um, if we have any questions for Hannah, please put them into the Q&A. There's a couple that look like they might be questions, but I'm not sure in the chat. So uh, please copy and paste your any questions you might have into the Q&A section instead. Yes, please. And I forgot to mention, um, everyone is not at the same technological level as everyone else. So don't take on that burden of being the tech advisor for your group unless you really want to. And for my case, I really like using Word. So if there's ever a chance for me to help people use Word, I will. Thank you. Okay, I do see a new question. Um, from Jen Cummings. I love this idea of boundaries. I have a very strong, I have very strong work boundaries, but my colleagues don't and don't expect it. How do you manage that, Hannah? Um, just say no. Just say, <laughs> or you can use excuses and not lie about it. Just say that social, my social media is for friends and family. Um, I like to separate my personal and professional life. It's difficult, especially if you are in tech, because everything is so intertwined. But if you just say to people, I only want to keep this as a sort of professional business relationship for now, I think a lot of people will respect that. And if you're afraid, just say, screw it and do it anyway, because the worst thing that's going to happen is that people will see that you have you are a person with boundaries and they're going to respect you for it. Okay. So I see one more question um, from Kate Delba Delbell. Uh, Debel? I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, Kate. Um, Hannah, I appreciate the boundaries discussion, but, but what about those in power to make a change? Is there going to be a need to break boundaries then? Ooh, that's a big question. Um, so fortunately for me, I am part of a union. So any sort of like a mid tier upper management discussions can be had with very firm guidelines in place. But if you don't have that, you, I would suggest really maintaining a relationship with those in charge. Um, 
if you're unable to maintain those relationships with those in power, then I kind of don't know what to tell you other than bearing and gritting it, but that's not good for anyone's mental or anything health. But it is a matter of coming to a mutual agreement of what needs to happen and taking into consideration all the stakeholders, not only those people around you and under you, but those above you and their concerns. And unfortunately, I think a lot of that work of emotional labor and mental labor has fallen on women, especially, um, because apparently we're natural at it. I'm really not natural at it, um, unless it re relates to cats. Um, but at some point, everyone has to come to the same table and communicate with each other in the same language. Right. Using that as sort of like groundworks, I think you can start building up a relationship, especially if there isn't one. Right. Those are good thoughts, Hannah. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, next up, we have Ed Hill and Jan Matson presenting Hello, Goodbye, Starting and Leaving Library Technology Jobs. Ed is Emerging Technologies Librarian and Head of Library Technologies at Portland State University. He works with others at his library to manage the library's IT infrastructure, both internal and external, and he works on projects to do with accessibility and privacy. Jan is a systems and digital initiatives librarian at Westfield State University. He's passionate about workflow automation, metadata design, and digital preservation. I'm looking forward to Hello Goodbye, Starting, Leaving, Library Technology Jobs. My name is Jan Matson, and welcome to Hello Goodbye, Starting, Leaving, Library Technology Jobs. We'll be exploring, stepping into, and out of code and technology focused. My name is Jan Matson, and welcome to Hello Goodbye, Starting, Leaving, Library. My name is Jan Matson, and welcome to Hello Goodbye, starting, leaving library technology jobs. We'll be exploring, stepping into, and out of code and technology focused roles with a particular focus on positions in small to medium sized libraries where there's likely only one person doing this work with no one to provide on the job training. And we're really looking at early career library workers who are entering or leaving maybe their first or second technology job, and people who are taking over or leaving code bases and systems when there's no one else at the organization to maintain it, and you're probably wearing multiple hats of technologist and maybe some instruction or reference duties, rather than somebody who is hired to code almost exclusively or work within a team of technologists. And please note that the presentation, particularly the sections about leaving, presumes that you have some time and the environment that you're in is not toxic and you're not fleeing a job. We certainly don't wanna suggest that you should bend over backwards to rewrite code in the midst of a horrible work environment or some other kind of negative situation. Um, and finally, this is purely driven by our experiences in academic library jobs. We have no illusions that what worked for us or didn't work for us necessarily generalizes. My name is Jan Matson, as I said, and I'm from Westfield State University at the Ely Library. Uh, we're a school with about 5,500 total students, mostly undergraduates. Uh, there are seven librarians uh, and a single systems person to manage and build everything. That's me with some help with IT. And howdy, my name is Ed Hill. I'm the Emerging Technologies Librarian and Head of Library Technologies at Portland State University. And I am the former Systems and Digital Services Librarian at Westfield State University. And today we're taking a bit of a different approach uh, rather than your traditional uh, talk where one person talks and the other person talks. Uh, we're going to be doing an informal kind of interview uh, where Ed will ask me some questions and I'll ask Ed some questions. Um, but I also wanted to say that we have a theme, Hansel and Gretel. Um, as you well know, uh, a component of that story is um, children who leave a path of stones and then breadcrumbs. We thought that was fitting to today's talk. So the first question is to Ed. Um, what steps did you take to prepare to leave your job? 
Well, first I tried to drastically reduce the complexity of the systems I had built. In some cases, rewriting code to strip out maybe excess libraries. So I pulled the JavaScript framework React out of a project because it was a small, mostly static utility project. Um, and it was the only place that I had used the React framework. So it kind of seemed like a lot to learn for something that was kind of small and didn't really benefit much from, from using that framework. I also tried to improve the architecture, reorganizing files, refactoring functions, and doing things like renaming variables to make them more readable. And I tried to document on three conceptual levels, a high level lib guide that said at a big picture view, what the different systems did, how they're interrelated, and how you can get help with them. I wrote system specific documentation to give an overview of how to install and update APIs, workflow for vendor products. So think GitHub README, and then more atomic documentation in the form of code comments and Git commits to try to get at the why part. Why is this code the way it is? What limitations were in place when it was written? Things like that. What tools or techniques did you use to get information together? Yeah, so like I said, I used libguides to present uh, the broadest information because that was a tool at hand and one that uh, whoever was in the job would be using for other purposes within the job. So it seemed like a good candidate to present that kind of information. And then I used a technique called rubber duck refactoring based on rubber duck debugging for a lot of decision-making about rewriting or re-architecting the code. So what that is, is I tried to explain what the system or what a part of the system was doing or why I was using a certain tool to a rubber duck, like a physical rubber duck. And if I couldn't make the duck understand it, then I tried to find a way to make it understandable and then express that in the code so that might be a human might be able to understand it. Um, it sounds kind of wacky, but it's a really um, shockingly effective at times way of of making things a little more, a little more understandable. The last question is, what do you wish you had done differently? Well, I wish that I had used fewer tools or at least um, deprecated some of them when I knew I was leaving. Um, in the job, I wanted to learn and experiment um, and the job really gave some, uh, some room for that, which was great for my development. And a lot of the tools are genuinely awesome. Um, they're really fascinating to learn and really useful in the right context. But having a simple system that someone had to learn a whole ecosystem of tools just to update wasn't inviting when I knew that their job would not be all or really even mostly about uh, this tool or these, um, these certain um, tool chain. And in academic libraries, it can be a year or more between when you leave and someone else takes over, which led to technical debt accumulating in this instance. So for instance, uh, there was a a uh, security incident, uh, one of the hosted tools that we had, and there was nobody there to monitor it. Um, luckily, I, I was able to see it. But um, yeah, complexity is unavoidable and being able to learn to new technologies, is a great part of the job. But judging when adding complexity makes things better versus when it complicates more than it helps is something that I'm still learning, especially as this kind of judgment differs significantly between work environments and even individual projects. And finally, I wish I had thought more about accessibility on the staff side. We had done some work on the, the public accessibility of our uh, public pages, but when it came to documentation and things on the back end, I, I didn't really carry that forward. Um, if, I, if you're using screenshots, for instance, making sure that you convey that information in alt text or some other text-based method, doing a video walkthrough, making sure that it's captioned and that all the actions on the screen are adequately described. So you're not saying go over here, or where I've drawn a circle, but rather describing uh, specifically where. And then making sure a uh, link text is useful and not just uh, click here or um, learn more. Because you really don't know who's going to step into that role and you want your documentation to be useful to them and not just one more roadblock that they have to overcome. And Jan, if it's okay, I have a few questions for you. Yes, please. Um, so what steps did you take to familiarize yourself coming into the job? Uh, I settled in and, and uh, refreshed my Python and JavaScript skills. Um, I also, when I started the position, I wanted to get a good sense of uh, the various library systems, uh, how they functioned and interrelated. And I did that by meeting with various uh, library staff and IT 
um, to, again, just understand what systems I'd be managing, uh, where they lived, uh, what programming languages were used, and in what capacity IT would be able to provide support to me. Uh, I rev reviewed the library's uh, libguide, um, I, you know, the, the intranet to essentially uh, uh, that had put together uh, to give me a basic overview of the system's workflows. Uh, and I spent time reading through that code, uh, the comments and the readme files. Um, so that, that was really helpful. Um, the Rosetta Stone, uh, if you will, um, for me to understand the code. And, uh, and I studied the system vendor documentation. Um, the various systems that we have at the Ely Library um, all are, uh, have been around for a while uh, and they have a lot of vast uh, you know, sources of, of documentation. So I spent some time looking over that. All right, awesome. So what worked for you coming into the job and what maybe didn't work so well? Yeah, so um, the wiki or the intranet uh, that you put together was really helpful. Um, it gave me a broad sense of how things were, were running uh, and some troubleshooting tips, which were really helpful. <laughs> uh, I really appreciated having all that code uh, centralized on GitHub. It was very easy uh, to pull down, do pull, pull requests, uh, modify the code, push it back up. Um, also, having all the passwords in one place was super helpful. Uh, I know that uh, all the other librarians uh, at Ely Library really appreciate that too, but coming into a new position, it was great just knowing where all that was. Thank goodness all of the librarians were, were very patient with me uh, because there was a steep learning curve uh, that I had to, to climb up uh, to get up to speed. Um, and just those comments um, with, that you put into the code and the clear, clearly um, named variable variables um, and the readme files were really helpful. Um, your choice of programming language was welcome as well. Um, as we all know, uh, JavaScript programming is unhampered by overly strict principles. Uh, it could be written in wildly different ways, uh, whereas Python, which you ended up um, adopting and using a lot of, uh, has a strong community of practice and therefore follows a lot of good practices, uh, which are well documented. So it was a lot easier for me to wrap my head around a lot of that Python's co Python code. One of the things that worked was just to be more forgiving uh, with myself. I tend to be, uh, have high expectations uh, of myself, um, but we really don't know what we don't know when we first start a job. So that was helpful to me just on more of a psychological level. This library staff knew what they needed, but often were unable to explain how uh, Ed uh, would provide them with, with those things that, that they needed. So they would often be able to articulate what they wanted, but not how I could provide it to them. So I kind of had to reverse engineer a few things, but at least I had that context um, that was helpful. Um, and there was a few uh, complicated uh, workflows, I think, that were put together um, uh, in a way because um, well, they, they had a lot of workarounds kind of uh, uh, engineered into them, uh, likely because um, you know the the more uh, uh, turnkey type systems uh, were too expensive. So so instead of buying the the bespoke or the appropriate tool uh, uh, or licensing it, um, you know. Uh, Ed would have to kind of code around the problem, if you will. So um, there was one particular workflow that involved not only Python, but JavaScript, and it leveraged a lot of third-party services I was less familiar with, like uh, CodeShip, Heroku, uh, Rollbar. Um, but as Ed mentioned, it was a great learning experience, and uh, fortunately, Ed was uh, available to speak with, so that was really helpful. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, and so if you had magical powers, what would you have magicked into existence to help you starting uh, this job. I would have magic that rubber duck into existence and said <laughs> for it to tell me how to do all of that, uh, that work. Um, but seriously, um, I think shadowing uh, would have been great if I was able to do that with you or having you there to train me. But I understand that, uh, you know, that wasn't possible. It was a, had been a, over a year since you'd been in that position. Uh, alternately, it would have been helpful to have access to walkthroughs or, or some type of, for some of the more complicated workflows. Um, and by walk, walkthroughs, I mean maybe a screencast uh, or workflow diagram or union state diagram with some notes. Um, at mid-sized academic libraries, a cross-training can be challenging, uh, especially with a job as specialized, uh, specialized as this one. Um, but it could help mitigate some of those risks associated with staff turnover. So um, cross-training would have been good too, but I realize it just 
not that easy. Um, I do again want to thank Ed for devoting all the time to the handoff uh, and for stepping in to solve uh, that security issue that you had mentioned earlier. So this is how it was for us, and we hope it can be of some service to you. Just some final takeaways is that you can't over prepare. There's a lot of context out there. So the more that you can give your, um, your successor, the better they'll be. In many cases, we don't know who's going to take over the role and we can't predict the future. So try to be as broad as possible and make sure the accessibility of your chosen tools, languages, and documentation. And finally, wanna reiterate, be kind to yourself, take care of yourself. Um, it's hard work and uh, you deserve it. Indeed, and uh, Ed and I wanted to uh, thank you very much for attending our talk and we hope you'll keep in touch and ask us questions. That was great, Ed and Jan, thank you very much. So um, we're just gonna go right ahead into the last talk of this session. Kelsey George and Michael Bolum will be presenting where to start developing a metadata management life cycle. I know this is a topic that's central to many of our hearts. Uh, Kelsey is the Cataloging and Metadata Strategies Librarian at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. She also serves as an editor for Library Juice Press series on critical information organization in LIS. Michael is head of the Metadata and Discovery Unit for the University of Pittsburgh and he has contributed to large-scale digitization projects such as Historic Pro Pittsburgh and Documenting Pitt. So let's go right into where to start developing a metadata management lifecycle. Hello, and thank you to the Code for Lib community for having us. My name is Kelsey George and my co-presenter, Mike Bolum and I have been working on a project aimed at expanding practitioner knowledge beyond introductory metadata courses to build confidence when it comes to addressing complex metadata problems practitioners may face on the job. Part of this project has been the ongoing development of a metadata management lifecycle. Before we begin, we want to break down the concept of metadata management. One very brief definition is the administration of data that describes other data. Though concise, this definition does not do any heavy lifting to help a practitioner understand what it entails. The concept of metadata management is not new in library and information science. In fact, it began to emerge in the literature as early as 2003. Elaine L. Westbrook should be acknowledged as one of the visionaries of metadata management in ILS studies. Westbrook set out to define metadata management in a broad sense in the definition on the slide. In our current work in progress, metadata management tools and workflows, we propose a new definition that metadata management describes the ongoing cyclical nature of metadata work, which utilizes processes and policies guided by standards and best practices in the field to ensure the integrity, accessibility, discoverability, and interoperability of metadata. But what does this mean? This work is not something that can be accomplished via a one-time project. When you complete a remediation project, the metadata doesn't just simply live happily ever after in pristine condition forever. Metadata management is ongoing. Metadata management is cyclical. Metadata creation is a large part of the process, but that metadata will likely go through many iterations over the years. Whether that be as part of a project to improve the metadata, clean up the metadata in order to standardize it across the system, adhere to standards, prep it for migration, or otherwise improve its interoperability. Metadata management involves both processes and policies. Local practices and procedures guide the processes or workflows that we develop to complete the work at our institution. And metadata management is guided by standards and best practices. While institutional knowledge is an important part in creating workflows and designing projects, our local policies and standards should be based inside the larger context of standards from the field. And all of these aspects are in service of metadata integrity, accessibility, discoverability, and interoperability. In the next section of the presentation, Mike will go over our proposed metadata management lifecycle. 
We'd like to preface the, uh, the following slides. This is a work in progress. We're refining the process and terminology that define these processes. While developing this model, we considered other common life cycle models in library and information science. For example, data, life, data management life cycle or the digital preservation life cycle. We also took inspiration from a more general research life cycle in considering the process for conducting research where we identify a problem, gather information, refine the problem, design the experiment, collect and analyze the data and publish the results, we found a mode of thinking that assisted with compiling our life cycle stages. We hope this framing allows those who work in metadata management to recognize patterns and consistencies in their work. We believe identifying and taking advantage of these consistencies will allow for more efficient workflows. This is a high level diagram representing our life cycle. In the following slides, we will detail each of these columns. For the sake of clarity, we've kept the arrows to a minimum, but there is potential to move backwards, particularly at the stop signs, which signify check-in stages. We've also included iterate in many of the steps these are opportunities for refinement of our developed process. Scan is where we're defining our problem and reviewing available resources. That might be data, tools, staff, expertise, external literature. Uh, we need to think about our request. So what is the problem we're trying to solve? Um, how would we go about solving that problem? Uh, do we have the resources to solve the problem? At this point, we want to stop and check in. Do we have enough contextual information to solve the problem? Then we need to start thinking about our data. Does the data exist? Is it complete? Is it in a form that we can use? Uh, do we have access to the data? Uh, we should also consider our tools. What tools do we have that can interact with this data? Is the data in a proper format for us to be able to use with the tools? Um, uh, do, we, do we know how the tools work? Um, we can think about our team. Uh, who's going to work on this problem? Do the people working on the problem have access to the data? Do they understand the data and understand the tools? Uh, and finally, we can think about any other obstacles. Are there institutional policies we need to consider? Are there stakeholders that we haven't talked to yet? Uh, do we need to create documentation? Are there other barriers to this work happening? Um, at this checkpoint, we want to Make sure we've communicated with all of our necessary stakeholders in this process. Uh, make sure we have a full picture of the problem. Next, we're looking at our categorized step where we refine the problem and synthesize the gathered information. Once we understand the problem and our resources, what can we do about it? Uh, first, it's important to think about what sort of, what kind of metadata tasks we're dealing with. Um, can we uh, define them as analysis, creation, extraction, remediation, or transformation, or some combination of those types? Then we need to think about the components of our problem. Uh, can we categorize the issues with the data? Do we need to break this into multiple projects because the problems are too complicated? Uh, we should consider recycling. Do we, did we already solve this problem in the past? Do we have documentation uh, from when we did this work before? Uh, we can also think about reusing others' work. Um, have others already solved this? Did they document it? Do we have processes, code, and tools available to do what they did in the past? We can also rethink our problem. Is this problem similar to problems we've already solved in the past or similar to something someone else has already solved? What can we capture and reuse from that process? And here we bring in, next we bring in iterate. We review our problem, our data, and our resources. Are we still solving the problem? Do we need to reevaluate anything? At this checkpoint, we, we wanna make sure we understand our task, our data, and our potential solutions or obstacles to the best of our abilities. Do we need more information before we can move on? In develop, we're plotting our course. We're considering the data, uh, the requirements and the resources. This is the stage where we're creating and testing the process. Our design is the core of this work, but we need to think of some high level uh, questions that we should consider during this process. Are, is there a required path for the data? Are there dependencies between the tools that we're using? Are there any barriers uh, to the successful implementation of this workflow? 
We need to assess the risk of the project. Uh, what are the risks in performing these tasks? Can we undo if we uh, introduce a problem? Do we have access to backups or better yet a test environment or sandbox to do our work? In test, we're talking about the data set. Do we have a test data set we can use uh, to try out our process? Is the data set representative of our actual data? In review, we wanna confirm that the processes and the design uh, resulted in the expected uh, outcomes. Did we break anything along the way? And here, when we iterate, we wanna go back again to our request, our data and our resources. Are there steps in the process that are unnecessary? Did we miss anything? And at this checkpoint, we wanna think about whether these, this workflow really solves the problem at the root of our request. And we also wanna make sure we're absolutely positive we didn't break anything. In implement, we're running our processes, our updates and transformations across the full data set and reviewing the results. During the implementation step, we want to make sure that our process works when we're running it across the full data set. Did it behave as we expected it to behave? Was the process scalable when we're using the full data set? In the review step here, we want to make sure the process solved the problem and we didn't introduce any new problems. If there are issues, were they related to the data or are they related to the process or both? If there, can, we, can these problems be remedied and with adjustments, or do we need to move back to an earlier step and reconsider our process? Do we need a new set of data for testing? At the iterate step here, we want to return again to our request and our source data. Is everything that we're doing necessary, and are the components of the problem solved by our process? At the checkpoint, we want to make sure we solve the problem at the root of the request. And again, we're double checking that we didn't break anything now that we're bringing the full data set in. Finally, in evaluate, we're considering this process for if this process is worth maintaining. Is this a one-time event or does this warrant further development into regular a regular process with documentation? Here we're evaluating, we're thinking back about how the process went. Um, did it work? Does the process need to be adjusted? Do we need to start over? Could it run uh, efficiently with the amount of data we were providing? Then we can step into thinking about sustaining it. Was this a one-time thing, um, just sort of a project, or is this part of a process that could be a regular job? Do we need documentation, training, or additional resources? And how does this job interact or interfere with others we might be running? At this final checkpoint, we want to consider the cost benefit for turning this project into a process. What resources are required and do we have access to those resources? Moving forward with this project, we're working to refine the methodology and the model and providing case studies to illustrate how this lifecycle model can aid metadata work. If you have any questions or feedback about our presentation, we would love to hear from you. Our contact information is on the next slide and should be available through the Whova app and the conference website. This work will eventually be published in a book, Metadata Management, Tools and Workflows, published by Routledge. Thank you for attending our talk. Thank you, Michael and Kelsey. That was a super interesting talk. And it raises some questions for me that were raised for the previous group as well. Uh, we have very little time, so I'm going to um, leave a little bit of space if people want to stay behind for a couple of minutes into the break after these announcements to answer any more questions. So first, the announcements. Our community support volunteers for the second half of today are Ann Slaughter and Michelle Janovicki. I'm going to paste their um, Slack IDs into the chat for you. Um, next, uh, we'll reconvene virtually for the next set of preventer presenters at 2.35 Eastern time, that's 11.35 Pacific time. And the poster session begins in 10 minutes. So now let's just go back for a few minutes to the questions. Um, for Ed, what did you use for documentation? 
Did you use pen and ink? Did you use Google Drive? I know for code you used GitHub, but uh, people would love to hear more about that. So would I. Yeah. Um, so it was mostly in um, GitHub and um, like the README files and then libguides um, had a whole big, uh, nice stinking libguide. Um, but um, also my predecessor had um, done a, Laura uh, had done some really fantastic work of actually like making a binder. And so I had just like a, pr a printed uh, out binder of information about stuff that um, has now been passed on to Jan. Um, so um, that was kind of the, the biggest. We didn't have something nice like Confluence um, to kind of a, a documentation management system. Um, so we used what was what was at hand. Thank you, Ed. Um, our next question is for uh, Kelsey and Mike to do with accessibility. How are you defining accessibility? Do you mean publicly available on the web via systems, or do you mean accessible to patrons, regardless of their abilities or levels of ableness? Do you mean, if you mean web accessibility, how might metadata specialists contribute to web accessibility through metadata? And this question's from Julia Caffrey Hill for Mike and Kelsey. That's a great question. Oh, I should start my video, sorry. Um, I would say, I mean, when we talk about accessibility, I think we mean accessibility for all. Um, so I think in some aspects that involves web accessibility, um, but if people are unable to access the metadata due to um, any sort of disability or due to just poor web design, I think that comes into play too. Um, I'm going to relook at the question because I feel like I'm missing a part of it. Um, what was the second half of the question? Um, the second half, I think you did answer. The first okay. was how you define accessibility. I think you did answer that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, anybody it's a great else? question. Yeah. Does anyone else have anything to contribute? There were other questions regarding accessibility. And I think the guidelines are pretty clear and they work universally, although the technical details of how to resolve them do differ in how you'll re remediate different media. Please feel free to jump in, anyone. Okay, well, thank you everyone. I'm going to copy and paste the, um, the community sport volunteers into the chat so that you can access their information on Slack and get in touch if you have any interests or concerns. So we'll, re we'll move on into the poster session uh, and you have a few minutes, which starts at 2 p.m. and then at 2.35 or 11.35 a.m. Pacific time, we have the next session. Thank you, everyone.